But in the meantime, I'll start in, the, uh, in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular special meeting, regular meeting of the Planning Board of Township of Franklin has been provided. Let's all stand and pledge the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilman Chase? Here. Coral Houck? Here. Mahir Rafiq? Here. Cecile McIver? Here. Uh, Robert Mettler asked to be excused. Mustafa Manzre? Here. Charles Brown? Robert Thomas? Here. Jennifer Ragnow? Here. Godwin Amalola? And Chairman Orsini. Okay, we have minutes to approve. The first minutes are the uh, regular meeting of May 15th. Uh, Mahir and Mustafa cannot vote, so somebody else can make a. I'll move minutes. Do I hear a second? Second. Go. Oh. Councilman Chase? Yes. Coral Houck? Yes. Cecile McIver? Yes. Robert Thomas? Yes. Jennifer Ragnow? Yes. Okay. We don't have any resolutions tonight. All right. All right I would to the move public. to open to the public for comments on any uh, item other than what would be on the agenda tonight? Second the motion. All Same. in favor? Aye. 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 I see no, no one, one come coming forward. forward. I move to close. <laughs> Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the first item. On the uh, agenda for this evening is the three Swaminarian Satasang Mandal application. Announce that right. Good evening, Madam Chairperson, members of the board. Peter Lanford appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, we are here this evening. If I could interject a minute, Peter. The second application, John Sudia, are you going to be presenting that this evening? No, I am. Uh, I received a report this afternoon uh, that had a comment in it that uh, we need to meet with the TRC. So I'm requesting that the Sudia matter be carried to July 17th without, is that the date, Mr. Haley, we talked about? July 17th without further notice. Okay, so anyone here in the public that was here for the John Sudia hearing on Amwell Road, that is carried in, until our meeting on July the 17th. That will not be heard this evening. Uh, getting back to Sri Swaminarayan, uh, this was an application that was originally presented to the board in 1997 when I was a mere child. Uh, no, that was when I was first on the zoning board. <laughs> <laughs> no, ac actually, this was a planning board application. Oh, yeah. yeah. What I mean is, yeah. I know when you were a mere child. <laughs> Uh, and, and, I, and I think for discussion purposes, I'd like to uh, mark in evidence the original resolution of approval as A1, and I'll hand it out to the board members. I don't know if it was included in their packet.
And the reason we're here tonight uh, is because of item number 11 of findings of fact on page 2. Uh, there was a finding of fact that uh, at the time of the hearing, uh, we represented that there will be no outdoor festivals. Uh, the temple is proposing to, at certain times of the year, to put up a tent during religious holy days. And the question was, was, is that a festival or is that not a festival? So I thought it was better that we come back to the board to clarify uh, what we intend to do and what we don't intend to do so that uh, hopefully the board will amend the condition or, or impose a condition that clarifies what we will be doing in the future. And I have one witness this evening, if we can have him sworn. Murgesh Patel, 523 New Brunswick Road, Somerset. Thank you. you can be seated, Mr. Patel. Mr. Patel, are you a member of the congregation? Yes, I am. And do you have a title besides being a, a member of the congregation? Yes, I do. I'm yeah. the president. Okay. And um, the reason we're here this evening is because uh, of this condition that I talk to the board about, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and can you indicate to the board what you are intending to do at the facility at a f on a few certain dates during the year? Yeah, so the intent of the tent, tent is, is basically hold over a, uh, an area to hold people. So uh, a lot of times during the festivals, we get a lot of uh, a lot of devotees that come into the temple, and we want to make sure that when the temple gets overcrowded, we have an area outside where they can wait uh, while we can uh, let the devotees that are inside do their prayers and everything, and then they can come out, and then we can let the next batch of, of people in. The temple itself has basically two main rooms, does it not? Yes. One is the worship area, and the other is the dining area slash auditorium. Yes, that's correct. And on the high holy days, are both of those being used for religious purposes? Yes, they are. And the, 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 the temple itself or the worship area is used for worship, and what happens in the auditorium during those high holy days? Um, it depends. So one, one example is we have, uh, we have sermons and lectures and those kind of events where there could be priests, or we also have events where kids uh, are doing cultural programs and those kind of shows. Um, so that's what we use that area. And then also for dining purposes. Okay. And, and because you have those other things there, those, that room may not be big enough to house everybody. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and in the tent that you're proposing to uh, construct, uh, what would go on in the tent? Um, basically, people will sit there. Um, we might have a TV there so that they can watch what's going on inside, and then we'll have snacks and food uh, f for people to eat. Okay. And we are not asking for any approval to have any carnivals or social events or fundraising events. These are all related to your religious events, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. This is purely in purposes of a religious use. Okay. And you are not proposing to have any loudspeakers or anything else outside, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So if a person is in the tent, they, there may be a television within the tent so people can watch what's going on inside. Yeah, that's correct. The, okay. t the TVs will, I mean, they'll, they'll have sound, but it's not amplifi amplified sound speakers. Okay. And... Will there be any cooking outside? No, there will not be any cooking outside. And can you indicate how many times a year you're requesting that you have the ability to do this? Uh, we're requesting up to five times a year. Okay. And part of what the township in reviewing this indicated was that when you do do this, uh, you have to fill out an application for a, uh, a special event permit. Is that correct? Yes. And you're willing to do that? Yes. And you're willing to agree to any condition that, that prohibits any fundraising or carnival activities outside, and it would be limited to just the use of the tent for these religious events. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. I have no further questions. I have a question. When the rooms in the 
uh, building are filled about how many people are there? I believe um, so each hall has a capacity of 500 standing so that could be about, about 900 to 1,000 people. Okay, because I see a condition that you're limited to 500 people. So I think you must be asking for that to be relieved also. Uh, hang on, I don't know if that was a condition or just a... S you said it. I didn't say it, or I don't remember saying it. Number, nine, number five. The previous... You said, yeah. you said number five, it yep. says the applicant yeah, we, requests we would, that since this enforcement would be done by the fire department, it wouldn't be necessary to list it as a condition, which the board agreed to. So okay. I read that as a limit of 500 people. Yeah, and, and obviously they anticipate the possibility of having more than 500, assuming it meets, uh, obviously you don't have any control over the fire department, but if we meet fire department regulations, we may have over 500 people Okay. There. That's one side of that particular issue. Is there sufficient parking for this facility now? Y yes, there is. And in addition, there was an agreement, which is still in place, that we have the right to use this, the parking lot of the school uh, f uh, when the school is not in session. And, and obviously, these events are either in the summer or on weekends. So we would have the school available to us to use for parking, and that ha that agreement has been in place since 1999. What about September, June, and October? These events would be in on the weekends, and and again, if the school is in session, then we can't use the school, and we can't have that event or that large event at that time. Okay, in my mind, though, we still have to get past the 500 people limitation. Right. I I think I probably would need relief from that, assuming. And again, contingent upon it meeting fire regulations. Well, that 500 limitation in the original application was also based on, it also affected traffic, traffic circulation, and parking. So is it going to be necessary to hear testimony about those things? Because now you're talking about a significant increase in the number of people, more than double. If actually. You said 2,000? No, no, no. Whatever. No, we, we, he, he said that each of those rooms oh, had okay. the capacity of up to 500. Isn't there if a certificate of standing. occupancy for this building? There, there, is a C, there has been a CO, yes. And what is that for? I don't have that number. I asked if there is a certificate of occupancy for this building. How many people are permitted to be in it? Yeah. Well, the first question is, I have to assume there's a CO. The number, I don't know. That's not, that doesn't go through my department. But if it's for 500, then they're already doubling what that C, what the legal limit is. And how, how, what's the capacity of the tent? The, the tent is, a, is 50 by, I think it's 60 by 90. And how many chairs? How many people would that accommodate? Probably a couple, not more than 200, I don't, yeah, I don't believe. All right, I, I have a threshold question. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. There was not in the notice that there was relief from the condition as to the number of people. So that's something we're going to have to deal with. I think it's up to the board to determine whether that is what is called in the MLUL a significant condition, because if it is, then Section 10 requires notice of it. Uh, but I also have a catch-all phrase in my notice that any and other all relief that may be identified and the board can't, you know, the board has the discretion of saying I got to re-notice for it or the board can say since I have the catch-all provision that I have noticed for that as well as the uh, it's, other. It's, it's in the board's discretion. I just had to point it out and let them make the decision. I agree, Mr. Clarkin. Go ahead, Ted. Um, Mr. Patel, you, you said you had the capacity of the two rooms was 500 each standing. In fact, is it used with everybody standing? Um, so, yeah, usually it's standing or they're sitting down, but they're not sitting down in chairs and tables. They're usually sitting down on the floor, and that's why I stated that number. 
I mean, I think the board would be more comfortable if you said there were 500 people inside and then the reason for the tent is to accommodate a lot more people outside. I mean, if if that's what you want, we can, we can we can do it that way. I mean, uh, our our goal is to make sure you know we can have this event safely, and that that's why one of the reasons for this tent is so that we can meet the fire regulations and make sure that you know we're, we we have proper safe we're pro following proper safety protocols, and uh, or, uh, that's why we have this tent so that we can have that flow where you know once those people are done, we can have them come out and then people in the tent that are waiting for that, they can go in and uh, they can do their mm -hmm. services. I don't know if it involves us as a board in this application, but I think it would certainly, if not, and it would involve the uh, committee be, uh, because this would have to go for a special permit, correct? But that's the recommendation of TRC that every time they have an event, they have to get a special event permit. And I, you know, well, I, I would think they, really have to demonstrate they can handle the additional traffic with this oh. and the additional parking that will be necessary. Well, I, I have a question for the, the applicant. To what degree, so the, the tent, um, to what degree is it tied to the increase to 1,000? Or is, is the purpose of the tent to allow it to go above the 500? Or, it, or are they kind of two somewhat unrelated? No, to what the, degree it, are they intertwined? The, the issue is that, that it may be on certain days that certain a group of people may all come at a certain time. Again, we're limited to how many people we can have in the building, both by occupancy regulations and because we have things going on in the building, which like tables and chairs or if there's youth activities, there's a stage put up and everything else. So their concern was that the tent be an area where if people come and there's not enough room in the building. So we're not looking to increase the occupancy of the building vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, well, we may be increasing it vis-a-vis -vis the resolution, but I mean, we're not looking to add more people in the building, but basically controlling the flow of people in the event we have a large group that comes at the same time. I mean, the, the resolution mentions the 500 uh, figure twice. Right. And the second time it says that, um, well, it says the parking has been calculated with an anticip anticipation of an increase. This is 20 years ago, so I have no idea what that means and to what degree, you know, there was some, you know, leeway there. Should it become necessary, there's enough room on the, on the land to construct additional parking. Should it become necessary to increase occupancy, the applicant will have to address the planning board again. So, you know, this is the first time staff in reviewing the application wasn't aware that this was involving a double in occupancy of the site and you're bringing this to the board's attention at the hearing you know i think in fairness staff and the board need to understand what impact this increase has on the site plan is there enough parking to accommodate that it, how does that mr thomas i think brought up some good points how does that address traffic control and none of these issues, the, staff, I can tell you, I would staff, like to poll staff the board did not review right. that. As to how many of them would like to know what the certificate of occupancy well, is I, I, before they take a vote. Well, that's a different, that's a different matter. I mean, the, well, that's legal. But that's, this is a matter of how many people they can have on the site. And, you know, the, 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 the certificate of occupancy just is a square footage calculation based on the square footage of the building. Here, they're coming to you to ask for, you know, between the building and the site to have a, to have that increase go from 500 to 1,000. More I, than 1,000. They're, they're telling us they already have 1,000 in the building and they want the tent to, to accommodate another couple hundred. It, we That's also my need understanding. To know hours. I, I, can, I can give you the, the hours. But the, but the issue of the parking, Mr. Healy, is, is we're not proposing any to construct new parking, but we do have a parking agreement, like I said, that has been in place since 1999, which gives us the, the parking lot of the school. And, and with going through the process of getting, filling out the application for the special event permit, we have to demonstrate the adequacy of the parking with the anticipated number of people as you've been through these things. And, if there's a need for a police officer to control traffic, we're required to provide that as part of the permit. How many spaces on the school? 
I don't have that in front of me, but I can. The school's fields are used on the weekend, and particularly for soccer. And the parents park in those parking lots on the weekend. And well, they get permits for that. All I know is we have a lease with them which allows us to use them. And I, I don't want to get into an issue with the school. Yeah, there's a difference when the school's in session, and it would have to be coordinated when there are no other likely no other school activities. Right. Not right. just not just a matter of the school being in session, but they they could be playing a soccer game, they could be playing something at the in the gym. And that has never been a problem, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, we would yeah, we would coordinate this is a that with level right. of use. This is increasing the use of the parking it, lot. It, it it is the parking lot was there and made available in the event that there was a need for overflow parking. And again, th this, this tent itself is also in the event that there is a need for, to hold people in case there's an overflow of people that come to the site at one time. It's a precautionary action. It's not something to encourage more people to come. People are coming to worship. And if we have a rainy day, or uh, most of our events are in, in the either spring or summer, so the cold is not the issue. But if we have either a rainy day or a very hot day, it was our thought not to have people standing outside waiting to get within the building, and they can stay in a tent until they have the ability to enter the building. I understand that, but I have a very big concern that when we talked about this, when it was approved, when, when the whole site and its operation was approved, it was based on a 500-person limit. Now we're talking a thousand people. It's certainly, in my opinion, reasonable to think there's going to be more traffic and need for more parking. And that, I think, should be demonstrated that it can be handled. And I, I can accept July, August, you know, the, the school will be fully available, but I think that there needs to be some kind of research or assurance that in October, September, and June, there won't be something going on that might impact that part of it. And also, you've got other activities here. You've got a, a, a big uh, 4th of July celebration here at Town Hall. You've got other institutions in the area that are also doing things. Uh, and, and that's why the TRC recommended that we get a permit before we have our event. Well, TR, they, that's a requirement now, I think, here anyway, not just a recommendation. Question. Um, the weekends that the dates that you, there are no dates here, but you said one week long by three days in August. What days are those? Are they the, specific because you mentioned the, they vary. Are they random? They're, they vary from year to year because their religious holy days are tied into the lunar calendar. So it's not, for example, the third week of July every year. It's it's tied into the calendar. But it will be in July. It just moves back and forth. Yeah, it'll be probably maybe a week or two back and forth. So that's why we need state specific dates. But uh, and. And so based on our lunar calendar, depending on where it matches up, that's where we usually hold the events. So that's why it's not a fixed date. But it's usually within plus or minus two weeks. So one more follow-up question to that. And is grass, right? Um, house there. Across the street, their residence. Right. So, uh, in October, are you planning to have any celebrations uh, with music relating to Navratri? No, not outside. Okay, so not the outside. neighbors would not be disturbed. And uh, no, like I said, like he said before, we're not trying to hold any musical events or anything like that outside. That that will be all inside. Um, uh, it's just for a holdover area, and we've in fact gone and spoken to our neighbors before we had this, and and we we explained to them what we're trying to do, and they've been mostly um, uh, happy with that. So, so there's no Navratri Gurba celebration no. in the tent. No, not in the tent at all. No. The other thing that just came to mind is I I know I understand that these are five 
celebration, so you know, five events. But they actually total about 15 or 16 days. That's a pretty significant impact if this is happening. It's not happening five times. It's happening 16, yeah. 15. But uh, quite frankly, the, 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 a, a five-day event, we probably do not have the need for the tent during the weekday. It's the weekends that we do need the tent. But the, the whole event is a five-day event. But most of the people, and speaking to them, just come on the weekends. Uh, you're not going to have really the need of the tent, nor are we going to get the number of people during the week that we would get on a weekend. You're saying the right things, but I still have a concern because your, your testimony is that you're clients more I, I, or less routinely filling the two 500 people rooms, which is over uh, what you're supposed to be doing. Then that's the issue here. I, 500 I, is the limit. That's how do we deal with that? Again, if you need some more information, and I, I, I do respect your concern, Mr. Thomas, you were, you were here back in 1999, uh, we can get some additional information and come back and provide that information to you. Uh, we can count the parking spaces in the school if we need to do that, and whatever other information you do need. Will the obtaining of a permit require the hiring of a traffic officer? That is up to the township staff in most, uh, most instances. Again, for example, if it's a five-day event and there is a larger crowd anticipated on a weekend, township staff may say you have to have an officer there on Saturday and Sunday. You may not need one on Wednesday or Thursday because you're only anticipating 100 or 150 people. Uh, I've, I've represented other religious institutions, and, and it, as it works out, it's every year when, you, when they have an event, staff evaluates it, and then we make adjustments as to what we provide or don't provide. If there's a problem, we address it for the following year. But it's up to the staff. If they tell us we have to have police officers, we have them. It's, it seems to me that the number of people in the building is controlled by the CO, what it says the capacity is, and I would suggest that the board simply restate that the number of people in the building is as specified by its certificate of occupancy. Uh, that's a, Even if we don't know what it is, it's a hard number. And if you're having a special uh, permit for each uh, event, I think it, it's likely to be enforced, at least on the weekends you know, when the capacity is maximum. I, I just think, I suspect Mr. Patel is overestimating the actual number of people in, in the building. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I, I don't think we need to get into authorizing a further increase of number of people in the building because the fire department would control that anyway. But uh, do you know what the maximum number of people you've had has been at a time? I'm, I'm not sure right now, but but like I said before, that that's our goal is to, we want to make sure whatever that number is, we stick to that number and that's why we have this tent outside so that we can yeah. easily control that number because you can see from my perspective, if, if, if the temple is already full and then the people are trying to get in and I have to tell them, you can't go in here, and if I tell them, well, wh where do they go? They're just going to stand in the parking lot or they're just going to create traffic outside where instead here we can actually manage the flow. We can say, okay, why don't you wait in this area? We will. W uh, you can wait 10, 15 minutes while we'll ask other people to kindly leave so that other people can come in. And that way we can get a flow going instead of just people crowding because a lot of times the devotees, you know, they have they have very strong faith and they wanna they wanna be able to go in and do those prayers on those special holidays, and it's very hard to turn them away and just say you can't come in because we have, we are maximum capacity. But instead, if we say, okay, why don't you wait here? You can wait a few minutes while we get the uh, while we empty out the uh, the temple, and then you can come in and we can get a rotation going, and that will appease our devotees and that will actually help us control the crowd instead of just having 
chaos out there. Adam, if, if, I could, if I could just speak to the numbers, sorry to interrupt, but um, <coughs> I would have to review the minutes and, and figure out exactly how the parking was determined and how this 500 figure was determined, but I'd be hesitant to uh, suggest using the number for the CO because the CO is just based, there's two halls, right? There's, there's a worship area and a membership hall. So, and I heard, I think they're two, both 500 people rooms. So the CO may say 1,000 people, but the parking that was determined back in 1995 may have been based on just 500. And I know this board and the zoning board Occupancy sometimes based on testimony from applicants for religious uses, we've heard, you know, we go into the worship hall, the worship area, we pray, and then afterwards we go into the fellowship hall, and they're never used at the same time. And that you, so the CO may technically allow both of them to be occupied, but the condition of the board approval is they're not supposed to be occupied at the same time that because the parking's based on only one of them being occupied. So, and I, and I don't know the specifics. This just seems like that might be going on here based on what Mr. I'm Mr. Haley, here, here, here's a simple solution to this. We, we will agree to the condition that was imposed in 1999 to limit the occupancy within the building to 500 people. That's what the board approved. We'll keep it at 500. But we'd still like the tent in case more than 500 people show up so we can house them outside. And how many people would be in the tent? Maximum of 200. I mean, that's certainly lower. The only concern I would have with that is, do you know how many parking spaces are on the site? I, I don't off the top of my head. But, okay. but, but the site plan was approved. Okay. Based on that number. Based on 500. Right. And then you want to go to another 200. We don't know the number of the school. And I can tell you we've had, we, and it's in the TRC report, people parking in fire lanes, people parking in the detention basin, which suggests to me that there's already a parking problem on the site and you're proposing to add to it. The, there, there, is already, there was a parking problem. Uh, uh, Mr. Patel, who is the new president, uh, has informed the members of what they, where they can or cannot park, and sometimes they parked in spaces which are closer to the building so they didn't have to walk, not that there was a lack of parking, but I think that issue has been addressed. And that has been a problem in the past. I don't think it's been recently a problem. I think you know, if the board was inclined to permit that, what I would suggest is when they submit for their uh, special event permit, you know, the parking requirement is one parking space for every three people. That the applicant, applicant needs to demonstrate to staff that they have access to 700 divided by three. We can do that. Okay. Sounds like the start of a, of a, a compromise here. The uh, thing that I'm also then concerned about with this is where is the controls at 500 people, who, who's going to stand at the door and tell them to leave after they're already on site? When, when, there, when there have been issues with sites, I, mean, I can tell you staff's not sitting there with the counter counting 500 people. You know, usually you'll see evidence of issues with people start parking in fire lanes, people start parking in the detention basin. Usually fire prevention is the first one there, especially with respect to fire lanes and then there's evidence of overcrowding um, and we've had on, on a few occasions made people clear out and and in one one situation stopped the event altogether um, so it does get monitored it does when issues come up we do take care of it but we're not necessarily sitting there with the counter okay there is the the, the traffic is and the parking are issues because their their driveways are entering on to relatively busy streets all right and again as you repeated everything was based on 500 all right if there's 500 people in there there's still going to be excess in the tent so I don't, I don't know Here, here's the issue though mr thomas it, it, the issue is I mean, we, we can try to encourage people to come at various times, but the concern is if we have a member of the congregation that, that comes in, we're, we're limiting them to 500 as per the resolution, but if some people come at a peak time and there's more people on the site, again, even if we adhere to the resolution and say 
we're only allowed to have 500 in the building and we're doing that, I mean, if other people show up, they can stand out in the rain or they could stand out in the hot sun till they can get into the building. But if they show up, I, we have to deal with them. Yeah, but now you're putting it back. Uh, in, it, it's becoming now again an imposition to the town. It's not supposed to happen. And we're all sitting here <laughs> saying, this is how we want it to do. You're agreeing 500 here, this amount here. And now you're saying, well, but if these people show up, what are we supposed to do? Well, we need to know what you're supposed to do. And, 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 that, and that's what we're trying to address. We're trying to address how we handle them outside. And we indicated that there is sufficient parking between our site and the school. Uh, actually, when the, the 500 limit was imposed in 1999, we did not have the agreement with the Board of Education to have the school parking lot. That came thereafter. Uh, actually, that came out of... Uh, Unfortunately, 9-11, uh, because the school needed our site in case there was an emergency after 9-11, and that's how we negotiated an agreement. So when the board approved this application in 1999, the, the, the school parking lot wasn't even in the picture with the 500 people number. It's the school parking lot, is that a perpetual agreement? Is this forever? Yes. And, and there is actually a walkway connecting the two facilities. Peter, does the agreement with the Board of Ed state how many spaces, or is it just the property? It's just the parking lot when school is not in session, and that was, I, I don't have the agreement with me, but that was And my, we don't know how many parking spaces are at the school? I've never counted them. I don't know how many there are. You have a congregation member back there who seems to think he knows. <laughs> you, we, well, you have to be sworn in, but... I guess we, we can. Yeah, I guess I think we should. Up. Raise your right hand. Solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. Yes. Name and address, please. Nicholas Patel, 8 Brookshire Drive, Princeton, New Jersey, 08540. Uh, Mr. Patel, I, I assume with the wonders of the cell phone, you were able to get an answer by Googling both facilities and counting the parking spaces? That is correct. Using the Google images, I was able to count a uh, temple has around 175 spaces, and the school has 150. So again, if we do Mr. Healy's calculations, we're at a basically at a, almost at a two to one instead of three to one. As a matter of fact, if, if the temple spaces are at 175, even if you cap us at 700, we have enough spaces at the temple site alone. Yes, Deb. I, I refer back to the 1997, I guess it was, approval. Mr. Lanford stated that the maximum people on site would be 500. The parking has been calculated with the anticipation of an increase. Should it become necessary, there is enough acreage on the land to construct additional parking. Uh, should it become necessary to increase occupancy, the applicant will have to address the planning board again. I would suggest that we put on a condition that if there are any more problems with people parking in the fire lanes and in the detention basin, that uh, the temple be required to construct additional parking on site. That's just uh, really to put some teeth behind your control of it. We, if, if that's what you think is necessary, Dr. Chase, I, I'm not going to object to it. Again, I think it, it's an issue of enforcement we understand that there was a problem actually the, the administration there is a new administration and it's the intent to basically have the members do what they're supposed to be doing where it may not have been the case with some of the prior administrations well that 
uh, if that is the case, then there's no problem. And I, it won't be, that requirement and, will not have to yeah, be invoked. And, 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 and I think it might make the board more comfortable. I don't, I don't have a problem with that condition. And quite frankly, it would, we're here because the temple initiated this process. You know, I mean, many times, you know, somebody will stick a tent up or, or do something because they feel they need it without doing what they're supposed to do, but, but the temple in this case was proactive. They came to the town and said, this is what we want to do and how do we do it? And that's when, the, you know, the condition came about and, you know, again, we tried to err on the side of safety because uh, it, it may be that I could have argued that what we were doing is not a festival and I don't need to come back to the board because this is a religious event. I mean, there may be other things as far as occupancy. But again, I think what we, we're trying to do is get it right to make sure everybody's on the same page. Actually, uh, what I've been trying to propose yeah. is really a way to be able to grant what you're requesting and, and without I, the yeah. board worrying that I, I have no problem with that condition, and I don't think the temple does. Again, I, I think if there is a problem there, you know, uh, and we're cited, uh, and there's a condition in the resolution, uh, we have to come back and add more parking, we can do that. But hopefully, if, if we work things out with, and, and enforce what we're supposed to do and, ha and have our uh, members of our congregation use the school when it's there, and instead of parking where they're not supposed to, then we'll be okay. How do you how do you inform the school? How does that work out? Do you, do you have to tell them that you're going to be using it at a certain date and how many spaces you'll need, et cetera? It it it's not spate. We just tell them we're going to be using it on certain dates. It's and it's never been a problem. And we've already with the July event, we've already told them that you know we might need your parking spaces, and we've already gotten a go ahead from the principal. We talked to the principal. Madam Chair, I have a legal question for Mr. Lamford, if I could. Please go ahead. Pete, uh, in order to demonstrate the relief that you're seeking, you need to establish either changed circumstances or good cause for the relaxation or elimination of the condition. Can you... Uh, I, 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 is, I don't, I don't is it that they have more people? I don't, I don't necessarily think, well, I mean, obviously we're, we're 20 years down the road and in 20 years, a lot of things change. Uh, when we talked about a 500 number, uh, I think the demographics of this area and, and the congregation has grown. Uh, again, we're not looking to violate the tenets of what was approved in 1999. And again, we're agreeing to limit the occupancy of the building. But all we're trying to do is, in the event that we do have some overflow, is to protect against that overflow being inconvenienced or put in a situation of being in <coughs> discomfort by having to stand outside and, and wait to get in. Uh, and, and you can't control those things sometimes. They happen. I just wanted to get something on the record mm -hmm. that there's a legal basis for Correct. the board to act. And it sounds to me like you're weighing in on the side of changed circumstances. There is. Uh, yeah. Okay. I as think the increased size of the congregation is over 20 years is reasonably to be expected. Why don't you uh, just come in and ask for relief from the limit of 500 people and show us a and show a plan to handle it? I mean, then there wouldn't be any issues down the road. Here's an overarching issue. I would rather keep the 500 restriction, hopefully get an approval tonight because we have an event next month. And, and if we don't get an approval tonight, we can't put the tent up next month. Uh, I will discuss with them coming back, but I think we need to give you more information to get the relief for over 500 people. Right. And, right. and, and that's something we may, may very well do, but I think at least at this juncture, I would rather have the approval with the same number of 500 people within the building so that we can have our event next month and then we can come back and talk about other things. And uh, oh, maybe I shouldn't bring this up at 1 a.m. anyway. While you're at it, 
uh, I believe you have a sign on the building that isn't supposed to be there. No. That's Maybe that. we could come in and ask for relief from that. No, I, I think that's the sign that was approved. We were back twice on that sign. The first sign that we put up exceeded the size that was approved. We modified it, and the sign that's there is the approved sign. Well, I'd like to see that because I don't, I don't remember that, and I don't remember uh, anything being approved in that. There, there, there were three applications involving signs before the... the I guess I missed the meeting. Uh, I don't know if you were, I, I can't remember every meeting that you were at or were not at, but <clears throat> the sign that's there is the sign that was approved by the zoning board because we had to take part of the sign off. And, and okay. I, could, I could tell you that's an approved sign. Okay. Just for my clarification again, because I don't know if we covered it, what time would the events be happening? Like how late at night would things be going it, on? It, it would not go on beyond 9 p.m. They usually will start at 8 a.m. and that could be in the condition and it would not go beyond 9 p.m. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right. I move to open the meeting to the public. I think second. it's time for that. I'll second it. All, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone here talk about the temple application this evening? Please come forward, state your name and address. West Westerfield, 2 South Grosser Place, Somerset. That's the street. You have to lower the mic so it's right in front of your face so they can pick up you and yeah, they have to be able close. to hear you. Okay. Lois Westerfield, 2 South Grosser Place, Somerset, New Jersey, right across the street from the temple. With all due respect, my concern here is the increased traffic. And I already understand that if you have uh, an event and people are coming and they already exceed the number of people who can be housed in the building for their, for their practices. You already have the traffic in the area. My concern is that if you build it, they will come. So if you make it more accommodating for them, there will be even more people that will try to get there, whether they, they can be accommodated uh, properly or not. It increases the traffic. When the traffic is increased on Animal Road, there is an increase uh, of, of safety issue for the, not only the people who are coming and going and traveling through the area, but also the people who live on this adjacent street. We have had situations in the past where people have come and they have parked on our street, on both sides of the street, which prohibited me from getting out of my own driveway if I needed to. So uh, again, with all due respect, I would like to see that if you're going to approve of something like this, you also have to have stipulations in there that you are going to have traffic control. Thank you. Anyone else? Elizabeth Acapinti, I live at 6 South Grocer Place. We have the odds and the evens. The one side of the street is evens and the other is odds. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate all of your thoughtful questions because they answered a lot of mine. And I also wanted to say thank you to you for following the proper process. I think that it's important. And I just wrote some of my own thoughts for consideration that I wonder if they should just be taken into consideration. So um, one was to consider the reason that that restriction was placed on the property in the first place. Another was um, I've lived in my home for 15 years and I've never been notified of a noise issue that was testified earlier um, that we would be notified. And I know in speaking with my other neighbors, um, I don't know if you heard it, but I heard it, the gasp. None of us have ever been notified, um, to my knowledge, um, to 
the in advance of any noise. Um, consider the burden this places on the local residents and our right to enjoy our property. Um, consider the difference, because this is something that seems concerning to me, between an outdoor festival and the relief being sought and the implication of a tent. It just seems different. Things seem to be switched. Um, living on our street, we have the pleasure of having the 4th of July fireworks happen kind of in our backyard, which is a beautiful thing, but it can also be a very complicated thing. Um, we also, in that same area, have stage house and nightly music in our backyards. Um, and this approval would mean that we would have festivals and an influx of people more than half of the year. And I know it's five events, but for us it's also the 4th of July and whatever is going on from May to October at the stage house um, or at the municipal complex. So it's just to give you some of those things to think about. Um, we've had issues of drunkenness and craziness on our street that Franklin PD, I'm sure, has documented on the 3rd of July. Um, it's become quite a problem. And that's a municipal event that's not under control. It's last year, my husband literally could not pull into our street. Um, it was a it was a significant problem. The police were called. Tow trucks were on the street. Bottles everywhere. It was it was a problem, and it's gotten worse. It hasn't been um, reeled in. And I'm not applying that to you. I'm just saying consider the impact and the burden that that would have on our on our police department. Um, my other concern is to consider that a tent, the people issue, does not resolve the parking issue. And um, that, that just is a little bit of a concern to me. And I wrote very early on, consider the possibility that the legal capacity is already and has already been violated. Because I felt like what I initially heard was 900 to 1,000 people in the building. And then as soon as that became a hot issue, it was, no, there were 500 people in the building. So I just ask you to look back and listen back to what was testified to, because I feel a little unclear about that. Um, there was an intended size and scale to the building that is already there. And there are athletes and events at the schools on the weekends. So just consider all these things, which I think a lot of these things you have. Um, and if approved, I think I would love to see a condition that there would be no speakers outside um, and that that parking um, on-site parking construction would be required um, to just take some of that burden off um, and that the tent would be one tent with a maximum of 200 people. Thank you. Anyone else wanting to come forward and speak from the public? Please do. Uh, my, my name is Steve Boxer, 5 South Grosser Place, Somerset, New Jersey. I also live across the street from the temple. Uh, I know Mr. Patel testified that he had spoken to uh, people that lived in the area, and I'm just wondering which of those people he spoke to, because as far as I know, nobody in my block was talked to about your intended use of that property. So we have 15 homes, and I believe not one of them has been spoken to. Apologies. We, we actually spoke to the... The, our, our nearest resident, 1668 Amwell Road, which is on the Temple side. Not, you don't have to cross the road. He, he will be the one who is closest to Temple. He's uh, on the street behind, basically. He's there. So you we, spoke with one person. So you spoke to one person. I, I, I spoken to one person. That 16 as well. I'm not sure if the president has spoken to someone else. I personally haven't, but our priest and our my vice president has gone behind. They went to the street behind, um, and they did speak to that. And I apologize that well, uh, my Nobody. team. And, and honestly, if I ran a business, um, I would know how many people are allowed to be in my property. And at one point, you did say a thousand people, and then two hundred overflow, and then became five hundred people and two hundred overflow. So honestly, you can't have it both ways. You know, you're, you're the president of your organization. If you believe there's a thousand people there. You know, I'll give you 100, maybe 200, but it just seems like too many people. So the, what, what I said was the capacity of the halls, the two different halls, but I, I, I was not aware that, that we have a limit on the overall building, and that's what we were confused about. And what I'm, you said was there were 500 people in attendance at the same time in each, on each side of the property. I, 
I, I mean, I'm sure it's in the notes, and that's exactly what the gentleman said. So I don't know what the CO reads, but honestly, I do believe that all of these numbers should have been at your fingertips and your attorney's fingertips. If, if I'm coming to a presentation, I'd like to think I'd know these numbers or people would look at me and ask me why I was there. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Good evening, everyone. My name is Vivek Kalola, resident of uh, Franklin Park, 48 Edward Drive. I'm pretty new to Franklin Park. It's been uh, less than a year that I've been living here, and uh, it's great to have the temple right down because it's uh, one of my religions, and I think it's very, uh, very nice to have uh, these fest festivals and events. And like Mr. Uh, Chase had mentioned, um, dating back to the initial 500 people occupancy back in the day, you, you can't predict the congregation increasing, but it does make sense that it does increase, and that's perfectly okay, and it's perfectly acceptable. And as far as the parking space is 175 within the temple and on, another 150 uh, with the school, if you do the math, that comes out to about 975 people uh, in accommodation. I believe the request is just an additional 200, and that parking, whether it's used for sporting events or the the temple, we, we call it the Mandir, um, I think there's a easy solution that could be implemented by our new president and also the principal and uh, the sporting coaches, whatever amount of spaces they might need uh, for their soccer event or sporting event. Uh, especially when it's during school session. I know a lot of sports sometimes do not take place over the summer, so I don't think that is really in question. And no doubt, uh, as a new president, you can't really control what people in the past have done. So it's all about moving forward. And um, I implore you, I thank you very much for bringing this up front, trying to create a, a solution as opposed to be a problem and say, well, this is what you guys did without asking. I think they're looking to take the right steps. And I'm really it, it, sitting there listening to everyone. I'm really proud to hear that. And also to the residents in the back. Definitely, I would be really, really concerned as well if no one spoke to me. But again, moving forward, these are all things that we can do. It's just a matter of communication. I think that's what I've been listening to in the back, just trying to communicate and get on the right page. And I think that's reasonable to have a tent to accommodate a surplus of people that you can't predict. And this happens everywhere. I'm actually part of the same religion with a different township in Edison, and they have a massive amount of people. They use Middlesex County College's uh, facilities, and they bus people over point A to point B. Well, there's a path. You can just walk over. And as far as parking the fire lane and the, the fire hydrant, 100%. Uh, fire hazard. We can have someone out there to monitor the traffic. It's a simple solution. A member of the congregation can be there and say, you can't park there. That's your car. You got to move it. And these are all things that can be implement, implemented. But I think the bigger picture is the concern of the board to see and realize that there might be more people. Well, the tent is to accommodate those more people. And 500 per square footage of the two equals five plus five is 500 plus 500 is 1,000. So when Ms. Mr. Patel spoke, that's what he's thinking in his mind. And he did backtrack, if he did backtrack. He did say that we will put a restriction on that. He, he was willing to say that we will do what the rules uh, uh, say that we need to do. So I feel like that's reasonable. Now you just have to follow through with that. The fire department will be there. I passed through the temple. I participated in the temple uh, in many different locations. And uh, the township police are there navigating traffic, just like crossing guards navigate traffic in, uh, during school sessions. And I think all these things can be taken care of. So there really should not be much of a concern. And I know it's easier said than done. But I'm listening to everything. And 
I'm putting everything into perspective and to me nothing sounded extremely unreasonable. And I think members, Mr. Patel, I think members of the congregation of Armandir should definitely reach out to the community residents and maybe you can look into that and give certain people those roles and responsibilities to reach out and, and let them know that, hey, we're having an event that's gonna be taking place. And for the record, the, the temple, every, for the, the members of the congreg congregation that come, none of them at that temple have access to alcohol. We don't believe in that, that's just us. Now, do members of the congregation drink at certain events outside? Well, that's their business, who knows? But as far as the alcohol and the traffic with July, 4th of July, it will not be a problem with our, our community as far as the temple's concerned. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to come forward? If I could, Madam Chair, if this person is part of the congregation, in all due respect, they are represented by legal counsel. So I, I leave it up to the board, but I don't think this should be a situation where every member of the, of the congregation who's here is going to ask to speak. Are you the last person? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Hitesh Patel, uh, Aid Brookside Drive, Princeton, New Jersey, obviously paying tax to the Franklin Township. A um, couple really good points were br uh, brought up by neighbors about the uh, 4th of July traffic. Uh, that traffic is for the township. Uh, they, uh, there's residents coming and parking into the, uh, into the temple. Actually, the youths of the temple help resident uh, park properly and not park in the fire lane. Uh, we have seen uh, as, a, as a youth uh, about a few years back that uh, residents or the people who are coming to watch these fireworks um, drinking and making noises and we have cleaned up after they are gone the alcohol and all that. So our religious um, organization, our devotees, they are not allowed to drink. That's especially on the, on the holidays. Or <laughs> so it's not from our end, but on a, uh, surprisingly, or for, unfortunately, the events of the, in the July falls at the same, around same time when there's 4th of July fireworks. So we have seen that influx of traffic, but it's not mostly because of people parking on the streets because of the religious event. It's more of that because of the 4th of July fireworks, where I'm sure everybody's seen it, that the temple parking lot is extremely full, the, the township parking lot everywhere, there's people parking. It's not just the temple organization, uh, the religious festivals. It's, because of the July, 4th of July fireworks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Jeffrey. Uh, I also live on uh, Grosser Place. Um, I've been here for 30 years and I was here when the building was built, and a few times, maybe in the first five years, I went over to see what was going on, I was curious. And I was turned away. And I just chalked it up as, okay. Maybe as recently as last year, I was interested again to see what was going on in the building. Turned away. And the gentleman talks about how they wanna you know, make friends with the neighbors and stuff. They wouldn't even let me even peek in the window. The door was open to crack, and then it was, no, you can't come in. Um, I was actually once asked, I, I was walking across the parking lot, uh, just because I wanted to go from my house, which is literally across the street, uh, to the post office. And somebody instantly came out. You can't go there. You can't walk across the parking lot. Okay, I turned around and went away. Those are my experiences with, with, with neighborly things. Um, for one of my neighbors said that, the gentleman said that uh, people were notified. I was never notified. Um, I know none of my neighbors were notified. Um, and we're right across the street. Well, was I correct in hearing that the, the event would be from 8 o'clock in the morning till 9 at night for five straight days? Is that correct? Well, one of the events. One of the, one of how many? Just one or is it going to be? There's five events. One would be for five and e even one three-day, another three-day in, in September, 
a one-day event in June, a one-day event in October. Okay, well, I'll just speak on the five-day event. My opinion, with the noise that I just hear on the normal events that they have there, just sitting on my deck out in my backyard, I hear it. Um, and it's it's people. It's, it's not music. It's not... Uh, um, speaker music, they don't say nothing about that. That's okay. Um, that was a problem one time it was addressed, it went away. I'm happy with that. But if you have the amount of people they're talking about for that just one event, it's going to be a free-for-all. I know they're going to be on my street. I can't even pull into my street sometimes because I'm coming from New Brunswick after work to try to make a left-hand turn into my street. And people that are turning into the temple are making a right turn, excuse me, a left turn into the temple from the opposite side of the street. It's literally cutting across three lanes of traffic almost, one on their, on my side and two on their side. It's very dangerous. Um, and you have to wait there. Now I'm sitting there and I got traffic coming behind me. And to, quite frankly, I don't know if these people are going to stop. Now I'm looking in the mirror and they're coming up on top of me and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. Uh, three, four minutes is an eternity when you're waiting to make a left turn into your development with cars coming down that road at 40 miles an hour plus. That's, that's another main concern of mine. Um, you could also maybe... Um, use a, um, like a ticketing system. Um, everybody could be in, issued like a, uh, a time to come um, because if everybody comes at one time, who knows how many people are going to show up. Uh, maybe if, if they got some people coming at midday, some people coming in the morning, you could break it up if that might help. But um, just my main concern is the, is the noise volume of the people and where the tent is going to be. Um, if it's anywhere near the street, it's going to make the, the event even louder. Uh, for my quality of life. Um, and that's about it. Just wanted to be heard and I appreciate it. Thank you. Just to address, um, it wouldn't be all day that the timing when we said 8 to 9 p.m., that's just the maximum timing. During the weekdays, it would not be that. During the weekdays, you know, we would all be inside the temple and, and the tent, uh, like I said, that would be only on, on a Saturday or a Sunday or maybe Friday night. But during the weekdays, there, there would be no extra people outside and then the normal amount of people that we would have inside the building. And and I'm sorry that that people turned you away. I just came became the president, uh, I guess in de December. Um, so we are looking to make a change. We are trying to make a change. We are trying to reach out to the community. And I'm, I'm sorry, um, I had I had people go behind the sheet, but they did not go across the sheet. And I apologize for that. And I will make sure I will come personally next week, and I'll I'll meet with you all. But our goal is to change that perception, change that, that the way the temple did business in the last 15 years. We are trying to become more active. We are trying to be friendly to our neighbors. We are trying to be mindful of our neighbors. And that, that is the reason why we are here is tr try to have this conversation and try to try to resolve and try to try to appease our neighbors. We, we don't want to be a nuisance. We want you to feel like we are part of the community. There's no one else coming forward. Seeing no one move to close. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, one other thing that I think needs to be considered uh, when the building was first engineered, it was designed to have bathroom facilities for 500 people. We're talking about 1,000 people and now a couple hundred more. Um, have you considered renting porta sands for this uh, for your events? I, I don't know if that would be necessary. For, first of all, let, let's get the numbers w where they should be. We've agreed that there would be no more than 500 people in the building based on the original approval, and, and that's we're going to adhere to that. The additional people we indicated would be up to 200 in the tent. So we're talking about a number of a maximum of 700. So, uh, and again, it, I will have to check with code if, if there's a requirement for something for, for portable sanitary, we would look at that. I don't know if that's necessary. Can the health department be consulted? That, the, 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 health, that? the health department's involved when they do a special event that the health department looks at that and they could impose that. Okay. And, and, and if I may, just a, a couple points in addition to that. You know, we, we sort of, we look back at 1997 in the resolution, and in the resolution it also indicated that there were the possibility of outdoor activities which were picnics outside. 
uh, during the summer months, and that's in the resolution of approval. Uh, I think, you know, we haven't done that, nor do we intend to do it, but the board contemplated back in 1999 that there may be some outside activities other than festivals. And I think what the intent was for festivals was carnivals or, or noise generating activities. I think what we are proposing here is not that, number one. Number two, I think the fact that we are putting up a tent will probably ameliorate noise rather than if people were coming and had to wait to get into the building and were gathering outside and talking, that would be more noise than if we contained them within the building, uh, within the tent. Uh, I, I, so I think the concern of the neighbor, the tent would resolve that problem, not exacerbate it. Uh, and again, I mean, we will do whatever we can to try to stagger the people, but if people are coming to worship uh, and they happen to appear at a certain time, uh, all we're trying to do is accommodate them so they're not, again, disturbing other people, making noise outside, and I think what we're proposing here is a net benefit, not a negative to the neighbors. Will the tent have sides? Yes. Is there any other discussion? I'll entertain a motion. Uh, I do want to say one thing. I was thinking a lot, a lot during the uh, past few minutes that this might be one of the first applications on the planning board I think I've ever, I ever might vote against. I don't know. But it kind of bothers me that there's sort of a cavalier attitude in the sense that in 1997, this applicant, and I, in, as the attorney, you agreed to all these things. Now in 2019, the, the, the comment is, well, that was 20 years ago. We expected, everybody expected it to grow. No question, all right? But it's been over that limit, obviously, by the testimony for a very long time should have been in here asking for relief from that condition. The site can probably handle it. With on-site parking, it can probably handle it easier. I don't think that would have been a problem. But the, if, if we just accept the fact that, well, the approval was 20 years ago, we, you know, we, we accept that you're going to grow, so you're, gonna be, you're not going to be following that condition, then Routinely in planning and zoning, we put conditions like this on applications all the time. And what you're doing is you're making them all meaningless. This should have, in the, it, it's, you know, I compliment you, the applicant on coming in ahead of time, although it's only a couple of weeks ahead of time, but first to handle this application they should have gotten relief for the 500 people. You should have a plan in place for parking on site. And there should be, in, addition, in conjunction with that, a circulation plan to get people in and out. And the fourth thing is there still should be a way. You, you can't just sit there and say, we agree 500 people in the building, 200 people in the tent. But if people show up in addition to that, we can't do anything about it. Well, I don't accept that. You need to be able to say, at 500 people, this will happen, this will happen, or that will happen. Otherwise, come and get an approval to raise the limit. It would have, I'm sure, been done. Those are my feelings about this. So, Is, is, is my ability to respond now gone? Have we closed? Or can I comment on that? Go ahead. Okay. Mr. Thomas, uh, I understand your concerns, and I do understand your feelings, and, and I think there is a, a, a macro picture that we have to look at, and I, I think many of the points that you made are, are, are very, very valid. Uh, again, we have a new administration. I, I think that based on their experience here tonight and discussions I will have with them, we probably will be looking at the bigger picture and looking down the road and perhaps coming back here for further modifications uh, as may be necessary. Uh, or it may be that we have to change the way we do things to make it easier for us to live within the confines 
of the four corners of that resolution. I mean, there, there's a couple ways to skin the cat. Uh, I, I think at this juncture, uh, uh, I think we've demonstrated at least for the short-term need, which is that tent, which is only going to be used on a few of those days, even though that religious event may be five days, it's not, the tent is not going to be used every one of those days. It's primarily going to be used on the weekend. And again, I think you have controls in place to handle the short-term issues because of the special event permit and the review by the township staff. Uh, as you are well aware, I've represented other religious institutions within this community, uh, many of which have to get special event permits. And once there's a pattern in place, uh, most of them work very well. Every once in a while something goes sideways as everything does in life, but uh, a lot of the religious institutions do have to get these permits. The township works with them to make sure that they run smoothly so that nobody is inconvenienced, either the congregants, the, the motorists, or the residents. Uh, and, and I think in this case, if we are going to limit that 10 to 200 people, uh, I, I think for the short term, the interests and concerns of the, of the neighbors will be protected and your concerns will be protected. I do think that the members of the congregation have to sit down and if they want a, a larger occupancy, we'll have to come back. We probably will have to do a traffic study. We will probably have to uh, v clarify the parking spaces at the school and the ability to use them at the time we have those events and give you all of that information. But I, I think he, what we're doing here is right now uh, trying to ad address a, a situation where we're trying to protect our own uh, members of our congregation. Because if they do show up, they're still going to be there. The parking is available, and they'll be there on the site outside waiting to get in. And I think controlling that situation is a benefit for everybody. I have a question. The, the tent, is it what happens uh, after the tent? Is it a modular that you take it? Is it, it a permanent structure? No, it's, it's a rented tent. It will be rented for the event. It will be there for the, if it's a one day event, it's there for put up the night before, used, and the day after it'll be gone for the five day event. Again, it may not even be up for all five days. It may only be up for the weekend, but it's only there for uh, those religious events and then will be removed immediately thereafter. You have a company that's going to come in and put up the tent. Yeah, and, and also as as part of the requirements with the township, it has to be fire rated. There are there are certain things that that have to be done with the tent, and they have to. It's inspected by the uh, fire department. It has to have the appropriate ingress and egress, just like other buildings. So we have to go through all of that. Here, a motion. It, does it, would it help if I summarize the concessions or agreements that the applicant has stipulated? Um, one tent, no carnivals, no festivals, no cooking, only for religious events, no loudspeakers, uh, only the sound produced by the TVs. Um, again, one tent, 200 people. Uh, the tent will have sides, no fundraising activities outside. Um, I may be repeating myself, no parking in fire lanes or detention basin, not before 8 a.m., not after 9 p.m., um, and that they would have to obtain a special event permit uh, for each event. Um, and I'm going to suggest adding that they have to provide proof each time of the availability of the, the full, they really need access to a total of 233 spaces, including what's on site and then the remainder. They'll have to provide proof of that each time for each special event. If I could add a couple, uh, I also wrote down that the sides of the tent should be placed down so that the noise doesn't go any further uh, and uh, no cooking outside. With, with those conditions, I move approval of the application. <coughs> I'll second the motion. Councilman Chase? Yes. Carl Houck? Yes. Maher Rafiq? Yes. Cecile McIver? Yes. Mustafa Munzray? Yes. Robert Thomas? Bethesda Kinsella? Yes. Councilman Chase? Yes. Carl Houck? 
conditions in the special permit process. I'll vote a yes. Jennifer Ragno. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, all right, okay. And you can't go back 20 years, I know. Laura Liggett and Gordon Gunn applications next on the agenda. The gun family? Bears. Not this gun, but another gun. The stuffed animals? But yeah, that's what I'm saying, the bears. All my girls had them. Yeah, my children had them also. My father owned the biggest bank in the city. Four brothers. In the country. I think now they own. Oh, those are mine. Okay. Okay. Him was an architect. Yes. People think you're Mike Orsini, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Ms. McIver, members of the board. Peter Lanford appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, this is an application for a minor subdivision uh, for property known as Block 9, Lots 20.01 and 20.01Q. Uh, the purpose of this application is that the applicant has entered into a contract uh, to preserve a significant portion of the property that he owns in perpetuity as a result of an agreement with Franklin Township. Uh, what we are doing is creating a three acre exception. The remainder of the property will be a separate lot consisting of approximately 30 acres. Mr. Ardman will give you the exact numbers. And that lot will be preserved as part of an agreement that was entered into between Mr. Gund and the Township of Franklin. Uh, if I can give you the exact date, it was, but it was earlier this. Uh, <laughs> earlier this year, I don't have the exact date in front of me. Uh, but this, the site is a 31.62 acre site. So what we are proposing is to create one, what is known as a severable building lot of three acres and then the remainder of the site will have a second lot which has the capability of having a house on it but will also be preserved and cannot be further subdivided and must be uh, placed in agriculture. Uh, I have as a witness Mr. Ardman who can explain the subdivision and then also give the planning justification because there is a variance being sought. So after we Raise your right hand. Show me way to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you down. Yes, I do. Name and address for the record, please. First initial F, Mitchell Ardman, A-R-D-M-A-N, 575, Route 28, Raritan. And he's been here many times, Jurgen. Right. And, and, and Mr. Ardman, you've been here before and qualified both as, a, as an engineer and as a planner. Is that correct? That's correct. And you will be presenting testimony in both of those capacities this evening, correct? That's correct. Okay. And you've also prepared an exhibit uh, to assist the board in looking at the surrounding area and justification of the variance? That's correct. So the, the two exhibits, one is just the colored version of uh, M1, the minor subdivision plan, which is in your set, which has just been colored green. And the second one here that has some 
dimensions of the surrounding area. It's basically the key map which we have on our plan in the upper right, uh, which shows the adjoining lots and residences with uh, noted dimensions on that plan. Other than its color, is it the same as what was submitted? Yes, it is. I don't think you need to. So we would mark this as A1 then, which is the key map with front setback dimensions. Start uh, describing the site as slowly making your way around. Okay. As described, um, the property we have here is Block 9, Lot 20.01, as outlined in, in green. Uh, Canal Road is on the left side of the plan. North is up on this plan, so that's the west side of the, of the plan. Copper Mine Road uh, is where the it comes off of uh, Canal Road, makes a few bends and uh, fronts on this property, the northern and uh, to the eastern side of this property. So that's Copper Mine Road on the northern end of the lot, which we have shown here. Total uh, property area as described is uh, 31.216 acres. Uh, on the site right now is just a, a barn, which is uh, along Canal Road. That's basically, you know, in support of the agricultural use of the property, which it presently is. You can see on the plans we've submitted basically is, is farmland and open space. There are some tree rows which go through the site uh, in a north-south direction. Um, one's uh, towards the middle west. One's basically in the center. Uh, some other trees come up into the middle of the site. And then it uh, would adjoin the property uh, to the east. That property is lot 24.06. Uh, There's another tree row along the property on that side as well as the pretty much the frontage of Copper Mine Road. So as you travel up that road, uh, you actually see a pretty good tree road there um, before you see the, uh, the lot behind. It generally slopes down to the canal. Uh, the entire property pitches that way. So we're really a pitching away from the neighbors, uh, away from Copper Mine Road and away from the neighbors uh, to the east. Now, Mr. Ortman, you were originally retained by the municipality, by Franklin Township, to prepare a boundary survey uh, in anticipation of this transaction with the guns. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And your office uh, did prepare the boundary survey? That's correct. Okay. And thereafter, the project involved a severable lot, uh, which was part of the contract, and the location of the severable lot uh, was determined by Mr. Gund and submitted to Franklin Township for their review. Is that correct? Correct. And that lot, as we show and you described, that's a exactly three-acre lot. is in the center portion of, of the property here with frontage on Copper Mine right. Road. That's the non-severable three acres, correct? That's correct, the non-severable. The non-severable three acres. And, th and no, then there is a severable. The severable, yes. The severable three acres would be a separate lot that is being created uh, that will be retained by the guns and the township will have no interest in that lot. And that's the portion on the eastern side of this lot, which is also exactly three acres. It's 189 feet and change wide and the full width of the lot deep, which is approximately 680 feet. Okay. And can you indicate uh, the, the size of the surrounding lots and the frontages of the lots uh, in the immediate vicinity of the lot that we are creating? Certainly. And this is, as you know, in the canal preservation zone, and uh, we're basically uh, subdividing these um, um, in accordance with the lot average, lot size averaging of the zone standards. So if you go to the map we handed out, lot here. So just to, to reiterate the, the variances that we'd be seeking, that as I stated, it's 189.74 feet wide, 250 feet is required. That's for both a lot frontage as well as lot width. So we would need those variances. Another technicality is that the existing lot, as it fronts on both, is technically a through lot. It's not really a corner lot, so it's a through lot. That condition would continue after the subdivision. 
So uh, to answer your question, basically in this area, as actually with many rural areas, the towns of the town, uh, the widths vary greatly. If you look at your R40 zone, you'll see the large um, majority of the lots conform, 40,000 square feet with the required lot width because they were done by subdivision. These lots here uh, over time have been set up, have been subdivided or just been existing for many, many years. So as you see on the map, there's a great variety. Uh, I've highlighted uh, in pink on this map and corresponding to numbers on your plan, the lot width. So lot 2406 is 199 feet wide. Lot 2405 is 208 feet wide. Those are directly to the east. Across Copper Mine is 200 feet wide. Is lots 64 and 65. They're really combined into, into one. Uh, lot there and lot 66.05 is 189 feet wide. So those, as I stated, are all directly comparable to the lot we're proposing. And you can see just by visually looking at them, they go the full width deep, approximately the 680 feet as I described, and they're approximately the same width. Some of the other lots on um, Canal Road uh, similarly are, are narrow. Uh, those are the older lots that were established. Um, not as much as direct comparison, but I show them just for reference. And, and, and the reason that Mr. Gunn sort of suggested that we create the lot uh, going from front to back and not making the 200, 250 feet frontage, can you give, them, give the board some indication of what would happen if we decided to make it a 250 foot lot? So it would be about 60 feet wider and it would come down and it would come towards the back of the property. Uh, it would just be a, about 225 feet deep, uh, which would be about 150 feet off the back property line, which would mean that instead of having a, a solid edge here for to continue the farming operation, the open space, there would actually be a piece behind uh, the proposed dwelling here, which would be part of that farm operation. We thought it was a better layout, um, better planning to have uh, this line straight down, Mr. Gunn did, and I, I agree for the reasons. Okay, and since we are seeking a variance for the lot frontage, uh, can you give, put your planner's hat on and provide the board a justification uh, for the grant of those, that variance? Uh, certainly, so as I said, you can see in the neighborhood here that um, the lots surrounding this uh, differentiate and are several are well below the standards. So it's common in the rural sections of the town. Uh, so I believe with that, uh, we will not uh, uh, be out of character with the surrounding area. Uh, and since we're not out of character, I don't believe we'll impact the zone plan or the neighbors. As I also stated, there's a good wooded row between the proposed lot and the existing house. Uh, so that'll also provide a screen uh, between that property. So um, I believe we fit uh, uh, within the local character of the neighborhood. As for planning purposes, uh, I think we further the reasons of the purposes of the Act, uh, of the Planning Act 45, or 40 colon 55 D2. Uh, this would be under a C2 argument, a, a flexible C. Um, and I believe, um, provision C, G, and J. Uh, those all have to do with this furthering, this open space and uh, keeping this under farmland preservation. C is to provide adequate light, air, and open space. G is to provide sufficient space in appropriate locations for a variety of agricultural, residential, and it goes on to say an open space. Um, in order to meet the needs of all New Jersey citizens, and J is to promote conservation uh, as well as open space in the state and to prevent urban sprawl and degradation of the environment through uh, which would happen if it was improper use of the land. So we believe this is a proper use of the land, a proper use of the layout, and those uh, goals of the uh, land use law are furthered by this project. Do you see any negative impact by the grant, if the board were to grant that variance for the frontage? I, I don't. Again, we're consistent with the neighborhood. We have the tree rows surrounding us. Uh, we'll have a setback uh, to meet the property, which would be the visual as you go on Copper Mine Road. So I, I don't see a negative impact. Thank you, Mr. Ordman. I have no further questions.
Are you going to go through the TRC report? Yep. I was going to get there. I'm, I'm still uh, <laughs> suffering overload from the previous uh, application. Okay. Uh, there are just a few comments. Number one is the lot numbers are fine. Number two, we'll, we will provide deeds. We'll agree to that. Um, number three is the right of way dedication. We, we can provide the right of way dedication that is requested, Mr. Haley. The only problem is that does bring the lot slightly under three acres. Uh, but we, we would be glad to provide it if that's what you want. I don't know if you really need a right of way dedication because I don't see any imminent or even long-term widening of that road, but uh, if, if, if you... Well, it's, it's not just widening, it's for also drainage. So the adjacent lot, I would say, to the east, obviously they did the taking of the extra five feet or whatever it is. We, we have no problem doing it. Okay, and definitely on Canal Road. Yeah, there's, there's no problem. As the, as the lot to the north yeah. has it already. Yeah, we don't have a problem with that. Okay. I mean, couldn't you move the lot line to continue keeping the three acres? No. I mean, I, I, the other question I have is, what type of house are you going to build in that setback we, without a variance? Yeah. We, we, well, first of all, there's no immediate intent to build any house. Uh, obviously, at some point in time, if there is a house that's going to be built on that lot, there will be a variance that will be required, so there will be an application to the Board of Adjustment for a variance to build a house. I, again, it, you know, we probably need a side yard variance, but we're abutting what is, in, in essence, uh, farmland, so it's not going to have an impact. Uh, again, it was the thought that it was more important to keep the farm on a sort of straight line. But uh, that, that, you know, ultimately, if Mr. Gund or somebody else who buys that lot decides to build a house, obviously there'll have to be a, a development application. But the dedications can be provided. So let me just understand what we're talking about here. Copper mine is 49.5. So we're talking about a half foot. Am I reading that wrong? I don't know what the distance is to the to the lot to the east. That looks like whatever. The does, does, yeah, I, I, and the reason I'm asking is just I'm just trying it's to get a, to right. to the degree it goes below three acres. It's going to be like two point nine nine. Well, the, here's the argument you could say to get the fifty foot right away. It would just be the half a foot. To get 25 feet from center line is a different story because, however, that road wound up where it wound up and the deeds where they are, it would be more than just a 0.5 feet. It would be five or I six. Think, I think the intent is to bring it to the to the 50. My understanding, right? I mean, it, it's it's 25 to center line is more of a. Mitch, what is it, the what's the right of way to the? Uh, yeah, I believe that's um, actually over 50 feet. And that's probably just because the way somebody out to the east may have taken it, to, it looks like 25 feet center from line. the center line. Okay. Could we take it by easement instead of fee simple, and then you don't have a reduction in lot area? Generally, we take we, we would don't prefer take to it to okay. right. right away. Yeah, the note number three says right away dedication 25 feet from the center line. So again, if the intent was 50 feet or 25, so we could give the 25, it would either be under by a proc, if we say five to six feet, by about um, by about 1,000 square feet less. And out there, it's purely because of drain. Yeah. Providing it, we reclaimed that road probably five or six years ago. And we do have done some extensive drainage projects uh, And obviously, if that three-acre lot now becomes undersized, it's because of the taking of of a portion of it by the, the municipality. I have it as 2.97 acres. Okay, so you were on. Now is comment number three. Yep. Comment number four for the driveway location on 2.03. That's fine to be away from the curve. That makes sense. Uh, for number five, I think we would argue... Uh, the same is that when the house comes, as Peter just said, when the house came, comes in later, we thought about asking just for a blanket easement. As I noted on that plan, most of these lots here also, besides frontage, they have uh, set uh, side yard setbacks.
but I know this board generally doesn't like granting a blanket number if we can't really say how big the house is. So that's why we left it to the future applicant when they really know where the house is. And that, that would kind of dovetail into item six also. Uh, we know the soils are not great here, but it is three acres. And my experience here, as with the neighbors in those three acres, you'll find a place to put a septic system. You'll work it with the house. So we would ask that that condition also just be placed once uh, uh, somebody comes in with the house. The I think the rest are The just rest are standard conditions are fine. Yes, Mark. Discussion, any questions? I'd, I'd just comment that I would have been concerned about the, the building envelope, but I see that the next two lots up are about the same frontage and have houses on them. They must have side yard uh, variances in both cases. They haven't been there that long, I can't remember, but they're certainly within my time in the township. Uh, whereas the houses on uh, immediately on the other side of Copper Mine have been there more than 50 years. And also the houses on Canal Road. Yeah, the Canal one, Road ones are, are very old, and I agree, those houses, the direct neighbors are within 15 years for sure. Yeah. And they do have side yard variances. And one of the houses on Canal Road has essentially zero front yard. <laughs> I'll make a motion to open it to the public. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone from the public wishing to comment about this application, please come forward and give us your name and address. Gary Forsyth, uh, 125 Copper Mine uh, Road. I'm uh, Gordon Gunn's farm manager. We set this up this way to, with the three acre lot, uh, severable lot, just to go along with the other four houses around the corner. They're all about the same. Um, people are wondering about the houses. As long as the guns are alive, nothing will happen to these farms. We got three different lots, over 300 acres. They're looking to put most of it in farmland preservation. Everything they could, they want to do. Um, that's all I got to say. Um, they're hoping if they pass, maybe one of their sons will come or grandkids will come take over the farm. They've been in the farm since 1975. Mr. Gunn, every time a lot comes up, he tells me, Gary, go see how much. He wants more and more and more. So that's all I got to say, but um, it's not going to be really built on. You know, we're hoping someone comes in and buys the whole place if the family doesn't take it over. I can't imagine uh, just selling off the couple little lots for the money. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for your answer. And um, it's not the gun bear. I think you said something about the gun bear. It's not the gun bear. Oh, okay. Different gun. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> uh, just one technical thing. With the dedication on Canal Road, I think that barn is going to be, I think there's a slight setback variance for the barn. Again, that's related to the dedication. The barn's not changing, it's not moving. That's correct. That's a correct observation, Mr. Healy. Thank you. So that will be... And, um, and, and that's why you do the any and all necessary variances for things that pop up in the context of a hearing. I have one question, Madam Chair. Please. Um, with respect to the C2 argument, can you reach the conclusion that the benefits to uh, Franklin Township substantially outweigh any detriments? Uh, yes, I can by preserving this, this open space and providing this, this parcel, I, I can reach that conclusion. Thank you. There's no other discussion. I'll entertain a motion. I move the approval of the application as submitted. Second. With the 
dedications and the very minor variances that have arisen as a result of the right of way dedications. Second. Chairman Chase? Aye. Yes. Chairman Chase. Councilman Chase. Carl Houck? Yes. Maher Rafiq? Yes. Cecile McIver? Yes. Mustafa Mansray? Yes. Robert Thomas? Yes. And Jennifer Ragnall? Yes. Ms. McIver, the next application is mine. Can, I, can we take five minutes while I? Yes. Okay. We'll have a five minute break.
privilege. Started later, finished. Uh, ready? Yes. Good evening again, Madam Chairperson, members of the board. Peter Lanford appearing on behalf of the applicant, uh, Rutgers Preparatory School. Uh, this is a property located on Easton Avenue. The addresses are 1345 and 1421 in Block 466, Lots 1.01 .01 and Lot 3. Uh, this application consists of some minor uh, site improvements across the entire <coughs> campus uh, that Rutgers Prep wants to undertake. Uh, there's also the completion of a building that was part of a previous approval. And in addition, Rutgers Prep acquired an additional lot uh, basically to the north of the existing campus, which we want to add to the campus and make it part of the campus. There is a house on that lot uh, at this time, and there is nothing proposed to be done with that house other than we want to include that lot as part of the campus. Uh, I do have a handout that was prepared by Mr. Uh, Turner from uh, Menlo Engineering, which is a reduced version of what's on the board to take you through the proposed changes. And I think we, uh, Mr. Turner, perhaps you should be sworn first and then we can identify the document. Raise your right hand, Scott. It's on this way to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. Name and address, please. Scott Turner, T U R N E R, 261 Cleveland Avenue, Highland Park, New Jersey, 08904. Mr. Turner, are you a licensed engineer in the state of New Jersey? I am, yes. How long have you been so licensed? Uh, approximately you're, 18 years. You're accepted. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Turner, uh, the exhibit that you intend to rely on, was that part of the plan set that was originally submitted in conjunction with this application? It's, it, it's very close to sheet number two, the overall plan. It's a bit of a hybrid, but it has all the zoning. The only real change is the uh, Google aerial image overlay uh, but it is, in essence, that plan. I but we can mark it as A1. A1. Let's mark we'll it, mark A1. it as A1. And what I'm going to hand out to the board members is identical to what's on that board. Correct. It's just a reduced copy. Yes, this is an exhibit uh, titled Rutgers Preparatory School Overall Plan Exhibit dated June 19, 2019, uh, prepared by my office. C2? It's, uh, it's very close to sheet number two in the submittal package okay. of plans. Okay. Correct. And it basically provides you with an overview of the entire campus uh, along Easton Avenue with Delaware, Raron Canal along the rear. Uh, north is, uh, well, for, for this purpose of presentation, we'll assume north is facing directly to the left of the sheet. DeMott Avenue is uh, bounded, uh, the, the school is bounded by DeMott Lane uh, all the way to the south. Easton Avenue is what the primary frontage is located on. So as Mr. Lanford pointed out, this property is known as Block 466, Lot 1.01, .01 and Lot 3. It does contain uh, currently 39.46 acres. Lot 3 is a, a small lot, a residential lot that was recently acquired by the school, located all the way at the northerly end of the campus. Uh, the property is uh, located in the R20 Residential Zoning District. And Lot 3 does have an existing house uh, and an existing brick outbuilding, small out brick outbuilding, and a, an existing paved driveway, um, semi-paved driveway that leads out to Easton Avenue. Uh, so we are here for three uh, relatively minor site plan improvements we're seeking your approval for. And we have one of those improvements are all the way on the north side of the site, one in the central uh, portion of the campus, and then one on the southerly portion of the campus. So we'll kind of work our way from the left to the right. So we'll start on the northerly side, which is the uh, proposed maintenance uh, building, garage, and storage modifications. So the proposal is to construct the first and second floor on that maintenance building. They would have 3,200 square foot per floor. Uh, that building already has its uh, garage. I'll, I'll, I'll call it the basement level that's behind the building facing the canal. It's got that basement condition already built. 
the concrete slab has been built all under a prior approval, I believe, from 2005. Uh, the, uh, the, the other building that's located in the area is a garage building, and we're proposing to construct a loft on that garage building with 1,067 square feet per floor uh, with a set of exterior stairs. And that building is the uh, building that's up in the most northeasterly corner of that existing parking lot, tucked up against uh, what's labeled on the sheet as Detention Basin 1. And that building has its footings, its foundations, and its concrete slab already constructed, again, in accordance with that 2005 approval. Uh, the additional uh, uh, improvements in this area will include a 35 foot by 90 foot paved storage area, 3,150 square feet. Uh, that area we intend on using for uh, approximately eight metal storage containers that are already out on the property currently. They're, they're sitting on the existing paved area. We're looking to expand that a bit to allow them to sit within this new pavement area. Uh, the intent is to have these uh, storage containers there on a temporary basis. Once the other two buildings come online and are occupied, the storage areas will be moved into those two buildings and then those storage containers will be uh, removed from the site completely. Uh, we're also in that area doing some other minor modifications. We're looking to uh, reduce the, uh, a landscaped area that's curbed currently. There's an island in that area. We'd like to pave it, stripe it. It's not an area that's open for public use. The, uh, the, there's no, uh, nobody other in that area other than the, really the maintenance people that, uh, that service the school itself. And it will help facilitate the movements in and around that area, specifically from when they're moving uh, things about. Uh, we're also adding a paved uh, driveway uh, connector uh, that's located uh, off of the existing teed intersection that comes off of the jug handle uh, off from Willow Avenue. Uh, we're showing that currently as a curbed and paved driveway at 22 feet wide. Uh, there was a comment in one of the staff reports that there was a concern that making that a four-way intersection may be inappropriate and be a little confusing. Uh, so we do agree. We're going to narrow that down to 15 feet wide. Uh, we'd like to also possibly not even curb it at this point, make it more of a, just a, a service driveway that would be used just for uh, the maintenance staff at the school itself. And we'll, we'll eliminate some of the large radii that we have, and we're going to assign it as well to restrict movements in and out of that area. And we're also going to remove a portion of the existing driveway that's currently servicing the house on, on lot, uh, lot three. Uh, th that that driveway that leads out to Easton Avenue will be removed to a portion to a, a, a location approximately located at the front of the existing house. Enough, we're going to maintain enough of it to, to connect in that existing that new paved driveway to the existing driveway to allow that access to occur. And on the side, the most northerly side of the boundary of the, pro of the property, we're going to provide some additional landscaping to comply with the buffer standards. Uh, we're providing 49 evergreen trees and three deciduous trees uh, in a double row fashion. I know Mr. Healy's report indicated that uh, he still feels that there's some additional improvements necessary to comply with the strict standards of Section 112.47H, which are the requirements and we will certainly agree to comply with those standards. There is an existing fence along that area, but it doesn't run the entire length. So we'll review that fence, and if it's in disrepair, it'll be replaced and extended uh, to comply, and we'll provide a, a, a revised plan to staff for review if the board acts favorably on the application. So we're not seeking any variances relative to that particular buffer ordinance requirement. And lastly, within this area, we have uh, just one new light pole being installed immediately behind the curb of that new uh, paved storage area where those temporary containers will be just to provide some additional security. All right, Scott, before you move to the next area, also there is a curb cut for the, the, the house on Easton Avenue. That curb cut will be eliminated as part of the improvements. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. That will be eliminated as well. Okay. Okay, any questions in terms of that area? Okay, so we're going to move over to the central uh, uh, located uh, improvement, which is the proposed turf field pavilion, uh, and that is located at the uh, southwest corner of the existing uh, sports field that's uh, the closest field to the canal. Uh, this will be a new 
uh, structure, uh, 16 foot by 29 foot four. It's approximately 470 square feet. Uh, that structure will contain uh, permanent bathroom facilities. It will have an outdoor um, drinking fountain. There'll be a small concession stand, and then there'll also be a small uh, storage area in there as well for the, uh, the, 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 the to hold the sports equipment rather than having to, you know, trek them back and forth on other parts of the campus. Uh, in addition to that uh, building, there will be an overhang uh, built in that area as well. Uh, that overhang is approximately 24 foot by 40 foot. Uh, that will have a roof on top of that uh, to provide some protection for people that are in that area. And then, of course, we'll have the uh, necessary uh, connections for sidewalks and, and ramping and that type of thing to make it all ADA compliant uh, and lead them up to the uh, the elevation of the existing uh, sports field. And, and we're also, in order to mitigate some of the impervious coverage that we're adding, we are adding a slight impervious coverage. Uh, we're having a slight impervious coverage increase on the property. Uh, so within this turf field pavilion area, we're proposing to build a stone dry well. Uh, we provided that on the uh, submitted plans, and we'll provide uh, CME's office with the necessary calculations that they're asking for. And the last uh, improvement area is on the uh, southerly side of the site, and it's up against the, um, the, the field house or the, the, the gym uh, building, which is adjacent to the ball fields. Uh, it will be a new 15 foot by 36 foot nine glass enclosure. Uh, it's located in the northeast corner of the existing building, and that will be utilized to accommodate a new set of uh, stairs. Uh, for that building, and that building, that enclosure is approximately 550 square feet. It'll provide a better aesthetic than that what's there today, uh, and it'll provide better access uh, to that uh, building itself, and it's just going to be an overall improvement to the campus. Uh, and again, we'll just do some minor modifications to the sidewalk to uh, connect to those areas. Uh, other than that, the other improvements that are proposed on the site are really uh, items that were previously approved by this board under prior applications. Uh, specifically, there was the uh, Performing Arts Center building that's shown on the plan that was previously approved. Uh, we have uh, an area where we have a new staircase and sidewalk addition from, the, uh, from an upper parking lot to get them down to the uh, lower service driveway up near the upper school uh, building, and that was approved by TRC under um, a prior meeting. Uh, so we're really only here for these three new improvement areas. Everything else has been previously approved by the board or the TRC. Uh, we're not changing anything with parking. All the parking is as per the, uh, uh, the site as it, it sits today. There's uh, 245 spaces required. There's 360 uh, spaces provided on site. Uh, like I had said, we're in that R20 zoning district. We comply with the majority of the bulk standards. Uh, we do, however, uh, require a... Uh, a variance for impervious coverage. We had a prior uh, approval for impervious coverage of 27.8%. 25% is permitted, uh, and that was really a product of the taking along Easton Avenue by the county during those improvements. Uh, this uh, new uh, development plan uh, will increase that variance by 0.1%, so we are seeking relief from that from the board for an additional uh, approximately 21,000 square feet of additional impervious coverage on the property. Uh, we're talking about an area of 39 acres, uh, 20,000 square foot, in my opinion, is rather insignificant. We are mitigating that by adding some stormwater management measures on uh, the property. Uh, we also have an existing nonconformity on lot three uh, for the side yard setback. There's a 15 foot side yard setback required and we have 6.2 feet to the existing house and then 8 feet to the small brick uh, building, and we're not aggravating those conditions. Thank you, Mr. Turner. I want to go through a, uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, this application has been presented, and we met on two separate occasions with the Franklin Township uh, Historic Commission. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And uh, they have, in fact, approved uh, our plan, have they not? They have. I think that approval uh, was obtained in March of 2019. Okay. And we also have an application pending before the Delaware River and Canal Commission. Uh, we have some cleanup work uh, to do with them, but uh, hopefully we'll have that approval shortly. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. But now, just real quick, sorry, the, the 
Historic Commission, didn't they recommend some screening? What, what yes, they did. Comments? They did recommend some screening. That screening has been added to this plan that's located at the uh, the north uh, easterly corner of the of the new uh, of the new of the pr proposed garage building addition. Okay, so that's shown on the submitted plans. May twenty yes. first. Correct. Yes, I believe that's on that set of plans. And do they have any other comments, or was that? The sum of their comments. That, that was the sum of their comments. Some, some years ago, they addressed that house and the window replacement and spent a lot of time on it. Uh, but that's beside the point now. To, to some people that appeared before the historic commission during that house and the replacement of the windows is not really beside the point. It's still... Uh, <laughs> It's, it still sticks in their craw, but anyway, those, those things have now been resolved. Uh, again, the just let me get back to Mark, Peter, if you don't mind. Yeah, that the landscape uh, requirements were shown in the March 22nd submittal plans. Okay, so I mean, if the board's inclined to approve the application, I'll just review the minutes of the historic commission, and then during compliance, we'll just confirm that they've met their requirements. Okay, and again, for the record, the Mr. Haley's report, the buffer requirements adjacent uh, or at the normally end of lot three because it abuts a residential property we will comply if we are not in compliance already is that correct yes that yeah, is correct let me let me comment on that which is in when i reviewed the plan and i made these comments about um you know extending it to the entire to the front of the property extending it to the back of the, where it's wooded uh making it triple staggered the the Mar may 21st plans do that um, I, I did not review this plan, even though it was actually submitted. Um, I neglected to review this in my report. Um, I've since reviewed it, um, and I find that it's, that, that this does comply with the ordinance. Okay. The one thing that, that you will need to provide or prove where you don't have the triple staggered, you're going to, you have to, per, you know, prove that there's a six foot high fence, solid fence. So I know there's an existing one. I have no idea if it's falling apart. You don't need to prove that that's a solid six foot high fence if it's not. Um, it'll have to be provided from the front of the house to the back of the brick building. Understood. We'll do Otherwise, that. where it's triple staggered, you meet the ordinance. Thank you. Okay. And again, uh, Mr. Healy raised the question of those storage containers, and uh, he opined that uh, they are not appropriate as a uh, long-term solution for storage of uh, equipment and, and other materials for the school. Uh, we concur with that. We would request that we be permitted uh, to keep those storage containers there uh, through no later than December 31st of 2020, which gives us the ability to construct the buildings, the maintenance buildings that we are in the process of, or will be in the process of constructing. Once those buildings are constructed, uh, everything that's in those containers will be moved into those buildings, and then those containers will be removed. And then what happens to the storage area? Uh, we probably will look to put it back to grass if that's... Got to be something. Yeah, <laughs> we, can, we can either move it back to replace it and restore it back to the existing condition, topsoil seated, or we can use it as just additional parking space on the property on the campus. It's already there. It'll be, you know, part of the impervious coverage, you know, variance that... The board hopefully will grant. Well, if you do that, you'll have at a minimum have to get administrative site plan approval because we'll have to see how. It... Well, so well, once those containers are gone, we'll, we'll sit down with you and we'll, we'll go over what we're going to do with that little section. I'd like to make a suggestion. Uh, first of all, I'd like to state that Rutgers Prep, I've always considered them to be an excellent neighbor. I live on DeMott Lane. My own children attended Rutgers Prep for a number of years. But since you are going to be adding to the impervious uh, pavement, I'd like to see a, make a suggestion that you put in a rain garden, help offset that. A rain garden not only is, is a good uh, measure, but it will teach the children what, what you can do environmentally to offset things like impervious surface. If, if you have any issue with us looking at that, I think we can do that then for you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
The next item in Mr. Healy's report is lot three. Uh, at the present time, there is no intended use for lot three. We may provide storage in the house, and obviously we would have to uh, check with fire to make sure we comply with whatever we are going to do. But there is uh, no intent for any active use for the dwelling on lot three at this time. If uh, it's going to be used for something and we need to get access again we either have to come back for an admin approval or site plan approval for uh, any improvements on lot three depending on what's going to happen but there are no short-term plans or even long-term plans at this time uh, we agree to provide a lot consolidation uh, we also have a report, uh, Mr. Turner, from CME, dated June 12, 2019. Uh, you've had an opportunity to review that report? Yes, I have. Okay, and we've addressed uh, some of the comments in there and indicated that we were going to uh, make some modifications to the site plan uh, based on that report. Is that correct? It is, and we're going to comply with the remaining comments in that report. Okay, and, and other than those minor modifications at that intersection, addressing all of those comments, would they in any way substantially alter what the board is looking at or we're asking them to approve this evening? Are they all technical in nature? They're all technical in nature. And then we have, uh, the police had no issue. Uh, there was a, a comment from the water department that there are no water connections or services shown we will provide all of those obviously right. is that correct correct we'll provide that detailing okay and the county has no objection to the, uh, the county board of health has no objection to this application and the county planning board had requested some minor uh revisions as it affects lot three is that correct that's correct okay. and we'll comply uh i don't believe i have any Further questions of you, Mr. Turner? Oh, one quick question. The, the increase of the impervious coverage from 27.8 to 27.9, in your opinion, is that a de minimis increase considering that this is a, a lot of almost 40 acres it is and uh, when you do take into account the fact that it is almost 40 acres we're dealing with a you know an increase of 20,000 square foot it is in my opinion a de minimis uh, relief request uh, we are mitigating that by providing some stormwater management additional stormwater management measures on the property and perhaps additional mitigation with a rain garden effect. absolutely that will help as well Thank you. Yes. Madam Chair, if the board is in agreement that it's de minimis, then we don't need the usual variance proofs, positive and negative criteria. That's fine. Do I need to poll the board? Is there anyone? The, the board has indicated their approval. Okay. If there are no other questions of Mr. Turner by the board, I will move to the next witness. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Venezia. Good evening. Raise your right hand, solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Name and address, please, Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey Venezia, V as in Victor, E-N-E-Z-I-A, 15 Bethany Street, New Brunswick, New Jersey, 08901. Mr. Venezia, you're a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey? I am. Okay. You're accepted. Okay, and Mr. Venezia, you, you were the one who prepared the architectural plans for the two buildings at the northerly side of the property, is that correct? That's correct. And you also presented the same exhibit to the Historical Commission, is that correct? That's correct. And, and that is what the Historic Commission reviewed and approved, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and that is a color rendering of the uh, buildings that are in the plan set? That's correct. Uh, do we need to have them marked? No. Okay. Mr. Venezia, can you describe the two buildings that we intend to construct uh, at the northerly end of the property? Sure. So as Scott, <coughs> Scott indicated in his testimony, 
the maintenance building, which is the front building and the building closest to Easton Avenue, uh, the basement level of that has already been, uh, was built back in 2008 um, when the entire uh, site was improved. Um, we put a temporary roof on that, and what's rendered here is what the, uh, what the building will look like when we add the two floors. It, this really is, with the exception of some fenestration changes based on some program differences, really ostensibly what was approved back in 2005 by the board. Um, it's a very simple sort of barn-like building, some overhead doors to give access to equipment and uh, storage inside the building, some offices and some locker rooms for the maintenance crews, uh, and then some storage areas up in the, at the attic of that facility. Um, the back side of it is very much the same. There are some um, on-grade um, overhead doors that give access to that existing basement, and then the two stories with some windows um, and some small fenestration on the back side. It's envisioned as a completely sort of gray building with just uh, tones of gray in the roof. Uh, the, roof's a, the roof is a uh, dimensional shingle. We're using a cement board, batten, um, siding, and a uh, very residential scaled window in the building. The building in back of that, which is the storage building, again, much as it was in the approved plans in 2005, series of bay doors to give access and then a loft area mezzanine that creates additional storage space so the school can get rid of all of those containers that have been there. Okay, and again, the materials for that building will be consistent with the materials for the other building. As will the, the color palette, and correct. And the colors. Okay. I have no further questions. The board for this witness. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Richardson. Good evening. Raise your right hand. Solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Name and address, please. Uh, Peter Richardson, uh, 1345 Easton Avenue, Somerset. Mr. Richardson, by whom are you employed? Rutgers Preparatory School. And in what capacity? Director of Buildings and Grounds. Okay. And you've been working both with your professionals that testified earlier this evening and also with the township to uh, come up with uh, the plans that are before the board this evening. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you've heard the testimony of, of Mr. Turner uh, concerning the site improvements and Mr. Venezia uh, concerning the, the two major buildings that we are constructing. Uh, we also had two other aspects to the application. One is the pavilion uh, for recreation. Uh, do you have any renderings to show I the do. board of that I building? Do. <coughs> okay. And and other than the Rutgers Prep logo in the middle, with, is the rest of it what was submitted as part of the plan set in conjunction with this application? Yes. And that building is the one that Mr. Turner described that is going to be next to the athletic fields in the middle of the site, correct? That's correct. Okay, and, and, it, and that's the one that will contain the restrooms, uh, the overhang of the roof in case there's inclement weather, and a little bit of a storage area for... Uh, soccer uh, balls. Soccer balls, yes, okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other... Improvement is the improvement to the northern or the southerly end of the building, correct? It's the northeast corner of the existing field house. Okay. And again, that's part of what we submitted as part of our submission package? Yes. Okay. And can you describe what the existing condition is there and what we are doing? I'll do my best. So right now, this glassed area is half the size footprint and only a single story. And so you, you enter through a very uh, nice, attractive um, entry area and then go up the cement uh, stairs with no windows inside the building. This is the primary entrance to our field house. Um, and so we'd like to make it a little bit more of a, a presentable entrance. So we're gonna expand the, the footprint a little bit over to here and go up, you can see that the in, inside there will be stairs 
that take you right into the upper gym, whereas right now you have to go inside the building to get to the upper gym. This allows for a much um, improved aesthetic as you enter our upper gym. Okay, and, and this improvement along with the last one you described, they're not habitable spaces, they're there as amenities and, and to make the, Correct. Your, your campus work better and more efficiently. Correct. Okay, last question. You heard our representation concerning those storage containers. We discussed that and you're in agreement that those storage containers will be out of there by December 31st, 2020. And if for some reason your maintenance building is not built, those storage containers will still be gone by that date, correct? We will get rid of them. Thank you. No further questions. Are there any questions of this witness from members of the board? Public at this time? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Seeing no public coming forward or even in the uh, outer reaches, I move to close. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I think you've heard enough from me this evening. I would respectfully request that the board grant the site plan approval with the de minimis variance Thank for the you. impervious coverage. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. I'll entertain the motion. Second. I move to approve the application as discussed. I'll second the motion. Councilman Chase. Councilman Chase? Yes. Oral Howe? Yes. Maher Rafiq? Yes. Cecile McIver? Yes. Mustafa Manjay? Yes. Robert Thomas? Yes. Jennifer Ragnow? Yes. Thank you very much. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.